Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's so very nice to be able to speak here. So the action today will take place on the upper half plane modular the group SL2Z, the familiar modular curve. And I want to start by looking at low-lying horror cycles. We're all familiar with this picture. This is the space X. And I'm looking at a low-lying horror cycle of height 1 over t. Ht is going to be that x plus i over t, where x is 0, 1, or if you like, minus a half to plus a half. And if you project this low-lying horror cycle back into the fundamental domain, you can ask how, is, how uh, it is distributed. It becomes longer and longer, the larger t becomes, and it eventually equidistributes in x. That's a classical result of Peter Sarnak, whose name I see on the screen. <laughs> this equidistributes as goes to infinity. This result is, in fact, way more general. Um, but just to have a warm up, um, let me sketch the proof which in this special case is in fact two lines. We use Weil's criterion for equidistribution. So basically I need to check what happens on this horror cycle for some automorphic form. I look at the integral from zero to one, phi of x plus i over t dx for some uh, function x. Um, sorry, for, for some function phi, which without loss of generality, I can assume to be uh, an eigenform, and I want that this converges to the integral of, over the entire space, where my measure is, is a probability measure, and there is nothing to show for the constant function. For cusp forms, this by definition picks up the zero Fourier coefficient of phi, which is zero for a cusp form. And for an Eisenstein series, we know enough about the zero Fourier coefficient it behaves roughly like square root of the height. And so it behaves like one over square root t. And as t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. And that's all we need to show. I also want to talk about a discrete version of this. So pick. So let's suppose t is an integer, let's say q, and we pick q equispaced points on this horror cycle. So what I'm going to look at is the points a plus i over q, where a runs modulo q. And let me call this h star, maybe, in order not to have the same notation, h star of q. It's somehow the discrete version I take Q equispaced points on a horror cycle of uh, height one over Q. I'm sorry, uh, it's yes. a stupid question. Don't you have to average over T in your when you apply while criteria? It's like a distributed that T goes to infinity. Yes, yes. So, so I want to show that this approach is this as. Yeah, as t goes to infinity, right. And I have to check this for a compactly supported test function, right? But x is the parameter, not t, or the curve. How cycle is parameter. So then what you is with that? Yeah, yeah. Please. yeah I, I take, I take a, a fixed, I, I take a horror cycle of height 1 over t. OK, um, so let's, let's the same thing. I, I view this as being projected in the, in the fundamental domain. And the question is, does this, I mean, these are Q points, and Q becomes larger and larger. Do they equidistribute? Um, and the answer is yes. And this is, again, very easy to see. Basically, this is um, the set of the Hecke correspondence for the point I. And so this follows from non-trivial bounds for 
the norm of the Q thicker operator, which in turn follows, for instance, from non trivial bounds or closed down cells. Yeah, and we have seen them already in Terry's Tau, Tau's talk. Okay, um, so this is all very classical, and uh, this is kind of the motivation uh, for what I really want to talk about today, which is kind of a, a new generation of equidistribution problems, which have its origin in the ICM talk of Michelle and Venkatesh, and I see that Aksha is in the audience. So this is in some sense about the mixing uh, properties. Um, I'm not using mixing in a, in a like in a technical term, but you'll see in a moment what I mean. So let's let's look at examples. Let's take this discrete orocycle and apply a multiplicative shift. So what I'm going to do is I look at these points. And simultaneously, I fix some B and look at these points. And if B is invertible modulo Q, then this runs through the same points, but in a different order. And now I take this pair as A runs modulo Q. <coughs> and this is now a pair that lives in X times X. And let's call this H star QB. And the question is, so for the invertible mod Q. And the question is, does this equidistribute in the product space? And of course, if I ask the question like this, the answer is obviously no in general, because you can simply take B equals one, and then you are trapped in the diagonal and nothing happens. Of course, you're, just, you're stuck in the diagonal, and of course, it does not take you distribute. But okay, if you take a sufficiently generic B, then perhaps these two things are sufficiently independent so that in the end, it will equidistribute in the product space. So certainly no for B equals one, there's no hope. But so that the correct question is under what conditions for B that equidistribute? <coughs> and you can ask the same thing in the continuous case. So you take a horocycle like that, and then you take the same horocycle, but with a different speed. You run through the horocycle twice as fast, or 1.5 times as fast, and then you want to see does it equidistribute in the product space. So let's say for y without loss of generality, let's say within one or two or some fixed interval, consider H T of y, which is the set of pairs x plus i over t and x times y plus i over t, where x is in 0, 1. So same question, uh, certainly for y equals one, you're trapped in the diagonal, but under what conditions of y does this equidistribute? Two horocycles with different speeds. Okay, let me give some context how this is connected to the original Michel Venkatesh uh, mixing conjecture. <laughs> some context. Maybe the famous of all equidistribution problems for the, for the modular curve is Duke's equidistribution problem that Higner points equidistribute uh, in X. Vigna points, if you view X as the moduli space of elliptic curves, then Higner points correspond to CM elliptic curves. And if the discriminant becomes larger and larger, these CM points should equidistribute. 
and they do that. So Higner points, let me call this HD. This is the set of Higner points associated with discriminant D. They're a square root of D many, so they become more and more as D increases. They equidistribute this cube with important precursors by Linux. And the conjecture of Michel and Benkenfish is very similar in spirit. So I take a Higner point. And then on the set of Higner points, I mean, you can, you can identify this with ideal classes of Q square root minus D. And um, so you can let an ideal class act on such a Higner point. So you take an ideal class associated to an ideal A in this number field and act with A on X. And you take this pair, so you have a Higner point and kind of a shifted Higner point and you view this as sitting inside x times x. And the question is, does this equidistribute? And again, obviously the answer is no. If you take the trivial class, then nothing's going to happen. So you need some condition here. And the condition is that the smallest ideal in this um, ideal class has a norm that also tends to infinity with d. So this equidistributes as the minimum of norm B, where B is in the ideal class A, also tends to infinity, which you need just in order to escape from the diagram. Up until now, this condition is open, um, but there is a conditional proof. Uh, sorry, this conjecture is open, but there is a conditional proof. Like Kayutin. And this is certainly a very interesting question to think about. And uh, conditional on a couple of things. It's <laughs> so it fits very well. And it's also um, for a restricted set of discriminants. So you need two splitting conditions. Um, and so you pick two primes in advance. You can pick them in any way you want, but you pick them in advance, and then you can only look at a quarter of, of the discriminants, namely those where these primes are split. Okay, um, so this is obviously very similar in spirit, but it's in fact directly connected um, because this discrete torus cycle, H star of Q, is actually literally the set of Higner points of discriminant minus 4q squared up to a finite number of points. Now, this is a highly non-fundamental discriminant, or I'm, uh, well, I'm, I don't know if D is positive or negative. Um, let's say minus D here. This is a highly non-fundamental discriminant. I mean, this is the non most non-fundamental discriminant you can think of. It's a pure square. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so for this very non-fundamental discriminant, essentially the, the Higner points are all aligned on a line. Yes. Um, I was wondering, do the points that don't line up with this have any special properties? Are they interesting in some way, or just sort of random extra stuff you have to worry about? You mean these oh, one yeah. points? Oh, um, <laughs> well, I mean, it starts with the fact that this is the heck. So for Q prime, let's say, this is the heck correspondence um, for the P th or Q th heck operator up to that one point that's sitting up at, at up there at, at QI. Okay. Like, I, I mean, you can write this down. I mean, you know what the class number is. It's either Q plus one or Q minus one, depending on whether Q is congruent one or three mod four. You can write down what the quadratic forms are, and then you can write down the Higner points and you see it matches up to O of one. Points. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's return. Um, to these two equidistribution problems, these joint equidistribution problems, and let's ask what is the correct condition that ensures equidistribution. And this requires some preparation. Well, 
we define a lattice lambda that uh, depends on Q and B. It's a two dimensional lattice, consists of all pairs such that M plus BM is divisible by Q. Now, this is obviously a lattice of co volume Q. And what I'm interested in, well, what are you interested in whenever you see a lattice? The most important invariant is the smallest vector in your lattice. So let's call this S. S is the smallest, more of the smallest vector. It depends on Q and B. And of course, by geometry of numbers, it's bounded by Q to the one half because the co-volume is Q. Okay, so this is the important invariant, as we shall see. And in the continuous problem, here it depends on Y and So here we write, we can write an, a rational approximation by Dirichlet's theorem. We write this as A over Q plus O of one over little Q capital Q by Dirichlet's theorem. We can pick capital Q and then we find a little Q um, so that we get an approximation of that order of magnitude. And we choose Q to be just a little less than T, which is, I mean, this is not canonical. There's a certain degree of freedom. Um, and the important quantity is that is the size of this Q. All right, and here's the result that I want to present. And that's joined with Philippe Michel. Number A, suppose that S tends to infinity, then HQB star equal. So remember, S depends on Q and B. Equidistributes in X times X. And S tending to infinity means in particular that Q tends to infinity automatically because S is bounded by square root of Q. And for the continuous problem, we have a similar statement. Suppose that the denominator Q, which is very different from that Q, I'm sorry. But um, anyway, so the denominator in the rational approximation tends to infinity. Then HT of Y. Equidistributes. And we'll see, I will convince you, hopefully, that these conditions are sharp. And what's the slogan? What does it mean? I mean, okay, so what does it mean that Q is large? It means that in this Diophantine approximation, uh, somehow y is kind of badly approximable or not too well approximable. I mean, if y is one, then we don't have a chance. And if y is three over two, uh, we don't have a chance either. Yeah? But if it's kind of badly approximable, not, at least not super well approximable, um, then it will equidistribute. And the same happens here. I mean, what does it mean that this first minimum goes to infinity? It means that the fraction B over Q is not too close to a rational number with small denominator. So the slogan is that um, in order to ensure equidistribution, we need that B over Q and Y are not too well approximal. Now it has sense like described. Over there. So there is a this is a true Diophantine condition. And it plays the same role as this condition of Michel Venkatesh, uh, 
that the norm of the smallest ideal in the ideal class has to go to infinity. Okay. Yeah. Same class of thing minor arc. Right? What's that? Same class of thing minor arc. Kind of. Yeah. All right. Um, and again, I, I, I hope I will convince you that this is really necessary. It's not only sufficient, it's necessary. And I would also like to point out that this is unconditional. There is, we don't need any hypothesis. Uh, uh, and in this sense, it's probably the first uh, kind of mixing, first instance of the mixing conjecture that's, that's unconditional. Okay, usually I don't do this, but um, is there a question? Yeah, that's a small it's about the same size as large well so theoretically this theorem tells you that if you pick capital q you will find a large q between one and capital q and you will find an integer a which is co prime to q such that this holds now that's theoretically this approximation theorem so once you pick your capital q you can always find this and then you want to make sure that this q is not two five, yeah, but it also goes to infinity. Okay, usually I don't do this. I prefer to give talks where I don't need to work and I don't give any proofs. I just write down statements. Um, but this time I would like to give you uh, an idea of the proof. Uh, but I promise it won't be too technical. So or let's say proof sketch. So the title of this conference is um, maybe in a different permutation, but something like dynamics, discrete analysis and multiplicative number theory. I have to offer something in multiplicative number theory and dynamics. Um, so let's start with multiplicative number theory. And I will only focus on part A, part B will be similar. So let's look at the discrete problem. The continuous problem is very similar and has almost no major changes. Okay, again, we apply Weil's criterion. And so what we need to study is we pick a test function and then we test this test function on our set. And this test function is now a pair. So phi one, a plus i over q and phi two a b i over q. Now, this is the vial sum I need to study, and I need to show that this converges to the uniform measure, so the integral over phi one times the integral over phi two, which in the case of cuspidal test functions is just zero. So I need to show that if these are cuspidal test functions, then this uh, converges to zero. Okay, well, the most obvious step you can do at this point is to apply the Fourier expansion for phi one and phi two. And if you do this, so insert the Fourier expansion and um, yeah, you write this in terms of Hecke eigenvalues. And basically what you get more or less is a sum lambda one and lambda one are the Hecke eigenvalues of phi one, lambda two are the Hecke eigenvalues of phi two. The sum, Nm runs up to size q. So both n and m are, let's say, of size q roughly. And by orthogonality of characters, if you multiply this or if you, if you yeah, just sum this over a, you get a congruence condition. n plus bm is congruent to zero mod q. And of course, you recognize this. This is the definition of my lattice lambda. So basically, n and m run through this lattice. So let me at this point pause for a second and tell you why you can see already here that some condition on S will be necessary um, and something beyond just saying, okay, um, B must not be one or two, right? I mean, okay, if B is one, then it's obvious that it doesn't work. And if B is two, probably it doesn't work either. But even if B is, let's say, close to one half or something like this, it can't work. And let me explain this. A concrete example.
here's an example. Let's say I take Q odd and I take B Q minus one over two. So this is very much away from one and very much away from Q, but very close to like half of the half of the interval. And if I plug this in Q minus one over two, then this congruence simplifies enormously. And the congruence, so this becomes just n m uh, roughly of size Q. And the congruence becomes 2n is congruent to m mod Q. Lambda one of n, lambda two of m. And there is an obvious diagonal term, namely if 2n equals m. Diagonal contribution, if 2n equals m, and then we get one over Q times the sum over, let's say, um, M, I guess, or N or whatever. Uh, yeah, N maybe. Lambda one of N, lambda two of two N. And here, eigenvalues are multiplicative. So I can move the lambda of two outside. And then it may well happen that lambda one equals lambda two, because I mean, one of the scenarios is that phi one equals phi two, it's not forbidden, yeah? And if this is the case, there is obviously no cancellation. You're summing Q terms over Q, so you get something roughly like lambda of two, and this may well be non-zero, yeah? So, and you can easily see that this works in general if B is very close to an integer, or to, to a rational number with small denominator. Yeah, so we need somehow something that's kind of badly approximable, otherwise it's not gonna work. Okay, so how do we deal with this sum? We want to show it goes to zero. I mean, we have Q squared terms, but we have a condition mod Q. So in total, we have Q terms, we divide by Q, so the trivial bound is one, but we want to show it goes to zero. Okay, so there must be cancellation in this sum. We want to detect the cancellation. And there are basically two methods. You can either view this as a shifted convolution problem, which is well studied. So shifted convolution problem. This is good if in your lattice, you have a relatively short vector because then you have a short vector and a long vector. So this means you have one long sum and one short sum, and this is beneficial because then you can put the long sum inside the short sum outside, and this is going to work. So this works as long as your minimum S is bounded by Q to the one half minus theta, where theta is seven over 64. Um, so this is, has to do with the Raman, Ramanujan conjecture. Yeah, but it works for S not too small. Sorry, uh, yeah, not too big. On the other hand, if S is very big, it means you have a very well-rounded lattice. Um, and then you can apply a very different technique. You can just put in absolute values. Okay, at first this seems deadly, but then you realize maybe, okay, even though I can't make use of cancellation, I can make use of the fact that these values of lambda are on average a little less than one. There is a Sato Tate law that tells me that they are just by a logarithm a little less than one. And if you, then you use a SIF, you have a sparse sequence, but the SIF tells you that if you have a multiplicative function that's sufficiently regular, um, um, uh, so you have some, some information on distribution of at, at primes, um, then you know how it behaves on a sparse set like this, like this lattice. And if this lattice is very round, uh, then this works. Use absolute values. Of course, a SIF can only work in the presence of, of positivity. So you have to use absolute values, which is a big gambit but then you win in the end by a small logarithm from Sato Tate. Plus a sieve, plus Sato Tate. And this works. What about the potential dihedral form, which does not well, satisfy it? Okay, excellent. I will come to the dihedral forms later. They will save my life in the end. But this is even better because dihedral forms uh, vanish half of the time for primes. Right. So this Sato Tate law is even stronger. 
Yeah, so for Sato Tate, I, I win in, in, in an even better way. But we, they will show up in a moment, the diagonal force. So this works if S is not too small, let's say Q to the epsilon. And you see there is a huge overlap and um, this looks good. Now there is a problem which I swept under the carpet. Problems. First of all, in order for this, I mean, we are only winning here by a long way. So we cannot afford any loss and in, in particular, we need that these Hecker eigenvalues are bounded by divisor functions. So we need Ramanujan. So this only works under Ramanujan. And it doesn't work for Eisenstein series either because for Eisenstein series, there's a priori no cancellation and, and um, they don't satisfy a Sato Tate law. So it doesn't work for Eisenstein series either. Serious? Yeah, so this technique of shifted convolution sums is very robust. This works in all situations. But this SIF is much more delicate. And so in this range for S, which is an important range, um, we need both Ramanujan and we can't deal with Eisenstein series. So at this point, that's as far as I know, the end of the story for multiplicative number theory, this is as far as multiplicative number theory can get you. Mm -hmm. And this is only partial. I should say the advantage of this approach is that it is totally effective. It gives you an effective rate of equidistribution, um, namely a logarithmic rate. So it's, it's completely effective, but again, it only works under Ramanujan and it only works on the custom spectrum. It doesn't work for all test functions. So now comes number two, dynamics. And here we have uh, yeah, the great bonus that we can use a very strong classification theorem for joinings of Einzelian integers. And so the idea is that the limiting measure cannot be arbitrary. There are, there are some constraints what the limiting measure can be. And this classification theorem tells you what the possible options are. In order to apply this, we need some preparation. So first of all, let mu q be the measure on x times x supported probability measure supported on H star QB. The upper half plane is not so useful for this purpose. Let's move to the group. And let's move, in fact, to an S added version. So we lift this to the group, which is PGL2. And we take already, we don't need to take all the adults, but we need to take a few more places than just the real numbers. Divided by this. So S is going to be this, the infinite place. And then we need two extra primes, P1 and P2. G is going to be PGL2. And gamma S is SL2Z, but we allow denominators in P1 and P2. Finite volume quotient? Yes. Yes, it's still a finite volume quotient. I mean, at the finite primes, everything is compact. Yeah. Um, 
it's still a finite volume quotient. And in fact, it's a, this is a, a, a covering of the usual modular curve with uh, finite volume fibers. Okay. Um, what is gamma S? Gamma S is SL2Z one over P1, one over P2. So it's SL2Z, but you also allow denominate not just integer entries, but you allow entries that have denominators in P1 and P2. Yeah, so it's an S adic version. Yeah. PG. Oh, okay, fine. PG. Okay. I, I don't really know what the difference is. But yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so this. This measure is somehow uh, very useful to us because of two properties. First of all, it projects. Um, so it projects to the to the Haar measure on each factor. So on, on each factor, it does the right fit, uh, uh, right thing. But then the important thing is: so why did we introduce these two primes? Um, this is invariant under a rank two group. Um, that's diagonalizable, and this comes from, from these two primes. So this is invariant under a rank two diagonalizable group. Generated by <laughs> Diagonal one over P one and P one and diagonal one over P two, P two, which you can easily check. And so now we are in a situation where we can actually apply this classification theorem. And here are the possible measures that can arise. Thing. What's that? Let me interpret it more classically as some sort of like a correspondence type thing on, on the original. Uh, what, which, what, what? I mean, like, does this action have any kind of uh, connection? Well, this, this action is very easy to see. It's just the fact that basically it's, it's just the fact if you reparameter, I mean, that's what we did anyway. I mean, we started with this and then we said, okay, this runs through the same set of points and in the same way this runs through the same set of points yeah so so there is nothing deep in this i mean this is basically already given by definition okay so possible limiting measures are what I would like to have is the product measure. If I this will be integral of f1 times the integral of f2. That's what I would hope will be the limiting measure. That's what I want to prove. But there are possible under can other candidates that I want to rule out. And these are diagonal measures. So I embed G diagonally into G times G and I have the shift by H. And this measure works as follows. If I test it on a pair of functions, it's going to be the integral of F1. How, do I, how am I going to, okay. Times, I can act with H on F2. And so I have a group element H, I act with this H on F2, yes, and I, I integrate this over G. So this is uh, the argument here is G, the argument here is G, but this is a shifted version. Yeah? So these are the two types of measures that can occur for various choices of H, and then it's a linear combination of those. And I want to rule out all of these. Okay, so dynamics alone can't solve the problem because dynamics alone will give you certain measures that you don't want to see. 
And the idea is to use what we already know. We, have, we know already that under certain conditions, namely under Ramanujan, the cuspidal vial sums go to zero. And we will use this to rule out these measures. And let's study the simplest case. Let's suppose that H is the identity. Well, then I just take F1 equal to F2. I know that the vial sum goes to zero, but this one does not, okay? Now, H is not necessarily the identity, but that's kind of the idea. That's why I, I, oh, and of course, in order for the vial sum to go to zero, I need Ramanuja. So I need to test this on dihedral forms. For dihedral forms, I know the Ramanuja conjecture. So I test this on dihedral forms, and then I hope, okay, this does not go to zero, but the vial sum does go to zero, so these guys can't occur. Okay, now in reality, things are a little more difficult. And, um, So maybe the third ingredient is some automorphic representation theory, but we don't need to go too deep. So let me make a, a, con a very rather concrete uh, construction. So how do I get a dihedral form? I take a class group character of a real quadratic field of order at least three. And the smallest discriminant is 229. This is the smallest discriminant with class number three. So I take a class group character of order three. And this gives me an automorphic form which satisfies Ramanujan of level 229. It does not live on PGL2, it lives on GL2 because it has a central character, but I can get rid of the central character by twisting it. So twist by an order four character. Psi. And so I get something like uh, a pastel automorphic representation. Let's call it pi depending on chi and psi. Um, yeah, on PGL2. By the way, 229 is a prime ramified only at 229 and satisfying the manager. Now, what do I need to do? pick F1 and F2 in this representation space and show that F1 of G times F2 of GH be G. And I have to, I mean, this is a linear combination, so it's really an integral. So there is a measure lambda, which I have no idea what that is. Uh, this lambda can be anything. It's just some non-negative function, h, and I want to show that this is non-zero. Now, of course, the obvious thing to do is I want these to resonate. So choose f1 to be uh, the integral of h times f2. Lambda, so this is my, 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 my measure lambda. So then I need to show that let's say F2 is the spherical vector, so it's the standard mass form. So I need to show that F2 GH lambda H H. So the function G maps to this is not the zero function. Yeah, so I perturb my form a little bit by letting act various group elements on this form and then integrate it, and it must not be the zero function. Okay, I mean, it's totally obvious, regardless of what lambda is. I mean, this, this 
that this can never be the zero function. It's so obvious that we don't need to give a proof. Um, but actually, when you try to give a proof, uh, it's totally not clear how to prove this, actually. I mean, yeah. Okay, I mean, this is a non-zero function and you let H act on it. And I mean, how, how can this possibly be the zero function? Okay, so how do you prove this? How, how do you prove that regardless what lambda is, this cannot be the zero function? You can think about this while I arrange, uh, while I erase the blackboard. Now, this is, okay, so it, I mean, okay, this is an integral and, and, and it doesn't really matter in which model. I mean, I have given, I'm given a representation. It doesn't matter in which model I compute this. Integral. Um, if I have a G equivariant vector space homomorphism, then um, the integral, I mean, either this is a zero function or not. It doesn't matter which model I take. And um, the idea is, we compute this in the induced model. So at each place V and S, consider the induced model. So the induced model is the space of functions F with the following transformation property. If I have a general group element, this is, okay, we don't need the center because we're in PGL anyway. I have a unipotent matrix NX. I have a matrix and a torus AY. And I multiply, by, I multiply from the left by N and A. Then this N is not seen. And this behaves like a character. This is Y to the one half plus mu V, where mu V is the Langlands parameter at V of my representation. Okay, and the spherical function, so the usual mass form, the spherical function uh, is the function that's one on the compact. Yeah, so basically, this tells me that I can choose f in any way I want on the compact, and then the transformation behavior determines how it behaves everywhere. And the spherical function is the function that's constantly one on k. Now, here's the, here's the point. This mu v, if this happens to be zero, I mean, if I know that the function is constantly one on the compact, it's non-negative everywhere. Yeah? So I just need to make sure that at my three places in S, mu v is zero all the time. Because then in the induced model, my function f will always be non-negative. And then, of course, regardless how I integrate it, it will never be the zero function. Yeah? So need to make sure mu v is zero in S, which you remember is infinity P1 and P2. And we are lucky. At infinity, I know already it's zero because dihedral forms have eigenvalue a quarter. Yeah? So at infinity, I'm already done. So I need to make sure that at P1 and P2, the Sataki parameter is also zero. And that's easy to get. Yeah? So V equals infinity. Um, it's OK. The eigenvalue lambda is a quarter, and v p one and p two. The only thing we have to make sure is that p one and p two are split primes in K lying over a principal line. Yeah. A class group character is trivial on principal ideals. So as soon as P1 are split primes over principal ideals, the character is trivial, so the Sataka parameters are zero. And okay, so by Chebotarev, you will find enough P1s and P2s that satisfies this. You just need one choice. Mathematica gives me the following choice. P1 is 37, and P2 is 53. These are split in this number field, and they have, um, they lie over principal ideals. Um, <coughs> and with this choice, so if we test these forbidden measures with dihedral forms twisted 
um, and these primes, then we can rule them out. So it's a, it's in the end, it's a combination of dynamics and multiplicative number theory that makes this unconditional. And maybe as a as a last remark, um, this classification theorem of Einsiedler and Lindenstrauss also very nicely gives us directly that the same holds for n factors. So not only two factors, but you can take n factors. Once you know that it equidistributes in, on every pair, um, if you have the correct Diophantine condition, then it also holds uh, for n factors. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Could you say a word about effectivity since you've relied on the Sagotic theory at the last part, which if you had avoided, you would have had an effective result? Yeah, effective right. rates, I mean. Uh, so the, the rates are logarithmic. Yeah, um, but uh, where are you getting the logarithmic rate when you're using Lindenstrauss and Einzitler? No, 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 that's the price we have to pay. So once, once we, we uh, use dynamics, effectivity is gone. Uh, so it's not effective. Um, but it is effective on the subspace of cuspidal forms that uh, that um, have Ramanujan, which is a very small space. But there it's effective. The multiplicative number theory version uh, tools are effective. But as soon as you use dynamics, it's not effective. And I guess uh, this recent work of Elon and his co-workers is only for the Ratner effect effectivization, not di a diagonal case, which you're talking about here, probably. I'm not sure if we are talking about the same paper, but if we are talking about the same paper, then yes. Um, yeah, this this treats a different a different scenario. Yeah, diagonal, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You could have also tried to use polymorphic form, just last time, I guess. So, uh, yes. Yes. Um, I don't know if the, the no no that would work. Right. 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 Um, absolutely. I mean this. Uh, this was, in fact, what Philippe uh, suggested. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't matter. You can, you can either use uh, non holomorphic or yeah. Yes. So you studied this trend distribution of those two expressions. Uh, does it make sense to go higher expressions, like three, four, and so on? Do you know what um, I mean better? I, I, think, I think that's what I just said, but maybe we mean two different things. Um, so. What you, what you can do is you can take your points and shift. So look, look at n tuples. And each of them is somehow shifted differently. So basically, what you need is that the smallest vector in the lattice with B i b j inverse goes to infinity for all i different from j. That's the condition that you need. And then you can look at n tuples and ask how, how this is sitting inside x times and so on x. And this will equidistribute and in a non-effective way, so, uh, perhaps in an effective way, but we can all, only prove it in a non-effective way. Um, yeah, under this condition, which is necessary, yeah? I mean, I mean, these, these shifts have to be sufficiently independent, and then this will like distribute. You get equidistribution in the end. So that makes sense. The problem uses this Adelic language. Um, I saw the proof, but the, 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 um, the statement itself, not so much, but if, I mean, you can, you can translate this into an Adelic language. And I mean, in fact, um, you don't need to take the modular curve of level one. You can take the modular curve of an arbitrary level. I mean, this is used in the proof. Yeah? I mean, in, in the proof, we extend this already to a, to a higher level. Um, yeah, so you can, you can certainly generalize and rephrase this, but I think it's nice to state it as down to earth as possible. But then you don't, in this fundamental case, you don't get other intermediate measures, only, only uh... If I, so the, this this corollary of, of Einsiedler and, and Lindenstrauss tells us that if you have equidistribution of any pair, 
Um, already the diagonal case? Yes, then, then, so if you have equidistribution for any pair, then if you have equidistribution for the entire... Um, but then can you give other conditions or can you rule out other intermediary measure? Is it sharp for this multi? I would, or could you, would you be able to say some equidistribution state but then some intermediate? Well, this is, okay, so this is, I don't, I mean, so the, the, the limiting measure in this case under this condition, uh, is going to be the, the uniform measure. Right, but you need to rule out these diagonal cases. Right. It doesn't hold, but you can still get, can you rule out other measures or? Oh, you, you want the inverse reasoning. So once the, once the, uh, the, the equidistribution is given, can you like in retrospect um, rule out other measures? Is, that, is this the question? Never mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Detect just yeah, I'm, 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 never mind. I'm asking if there is another condition that and then give rise to other limited measures, but you can rule out for a different reason. Okay, I, I would probably I would probably say no, but I, I have to think about this, but we can discuss this later. Um, so as I understand it, you have exactly two primes because then this Linden Strauss sort of yes, yes. Uh, if you added more primes, that would in some sense make the dynamical load easier because there's sort of more averaging going on. That's right. Is, is there any sense in which you can you could trade this off? You could have like an increasing family of number of primes that goes to infinity, and maybe that would give you an effective bound from the ergodic theory if you worked harder on the other side, or is that is that oh, that is something you have to ask my friends Manfred and Elon. Right. <laughs> I don't know. So you're able to use those also as a black box. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We use them as a black box, and we we have just sufficient information available from multiplicative number theory to uh, to get the result. But it requires a, a somewhat delicate construction, but that just suffices. Yeah. I guess the question I could ask you is. If they, if their answer was yes, could you do it? So if do you, have, <laughs> do you have enough power on the, the number theoretic side to naturally kill off the case where you have two primes, three primes, ten primes? Um, um, probably yes. I mean the okay again it depends very much on the setup, but I mean the, the number theoretic side is relatively robust, and and all of this is. Okay, as long as you assume Romanujan, all of this is all of this is completely effective. I mean, just by a log saving, but still, I mean, this is very explicit. And it's, it, it depends polynomially on everything. It, it depends polynomially on the ramified primes and polynomially on conductors and everything. So this is very robust. There are no further questions. Thank you.